Thank you for coming today. My name is June Liebert. I'm from the University of Texas, and officially it's the Jamail Center for Legal Research, Charlton Law Library. But um, I have to uh, apologize a little bit. We have kind of a little bit of false advertising here. According to the sheet, I'm supposed to be talking about the Center for Technology, Teaching, and Learning. Of course, it hasn't been set up, so there's not a lot I can say about it. Uh, but what I am going to do is talk uh, primarily about um, instructional services, instructional support services, and um, I'm going to end with 10 things that uh, I hope you'll find helpful in encouraging faculty to participate in technology. So I'm going to start with uh, just a brief definition of what I mean by instructional support, um, who can do it, how I ended up doing this, and of course my 10 practical tips. I think 10 is the magic number here today. So instructional support can mean a lot of different things. Um, in a library, we have instructional services librarians who go in and uh, give bibliographic lectures for various classes. I'm going to be concentrating um, specifically on the technology end of it. So. I've just put up providing assistance and guidance to faculty using technology in the classroom. And this sometimes includes doing everything for them. <laughs> <laughs> so who should do it? I've seen all sorts of uh, different job titles, instructional technology specialist, faculty support specialist, instructional designer, design manager. I think uh, Chicago Kent has an instructional design manager. I'm, of course, an electronic uh, resources librarian, and IT managers also do it. I don't think the title really matters. It's really whoever has that right combination of personality, skills, sensitivity, and the background. So whoever is good at cheerleading, in a sense. So what are some of those uh, things that are not in most job descriptions that I've seen? Uh, you want somebody who's really service-oriented. Uh, Mr. Royce Mursky, who's uh, my director at the University of Texas, he always says, we try to provide a hotel level of service. So for the reference librarians, that means that we are all a concierge in a sense. You know, I was, I'm staying at the uh, Hyatt and they have this little card on my desk that says, perfect stay ambassador. We will help you do anything. And, and that's in a sense the kind of person that you want. Um, somebody who will lead a faculty member who's interested in technology through the maze and uh, get them to the end product. Especially at Texas, it's incredibly difficult because we don't have one centralized computing, computing service. We have a lot of different people doing different things. And I think before I got there, a faculty member who was interested in, let's say, doing a web-based web course actually had to go to the university to set up a web account, and then they had to go to a class that was held elsewhere to learn HTML, and then they had to do, I mean, there were just so many different steps, and there was nobody to show them the way. So what you need is somebody who can show them the way, be their advocate. Somebody who understands the technology and yet can still explain it to a normal person. This is a very difficult thing sometimes. Someone who's not easily intimidated. These are law faculty you're dealing with. These people teach Socratic method. <laughs> uh, someone who has a law or a library degree or a relative, rel relevant experience. I think the law degree helps when you're dealing with faculty because it gives you, I think it gives you a lot of credibility. And a library degree I find very helpful because when I, when I go in to help a faculty member um, set up a web course, I look at the syllabus and I can say, oh, you're using this book. You know, we have this in electronic format. Maybe you could integrate it into your class in this way. Or, you know, we have this resource and it might really help your students to to uh, learn it, learn about this at this point. So I think that there are a lot of things that somebody with a library degree can add that you know your average, your your normal IT person may not be able to. Coordinates well with all technology people in the law school and university. I think part of my job is uh, mediation, <laughs> um, mediating between the faculty member who wants to do. Uh, 
real video and you know have all of these wonderful multimedia things and then trying to talk the IT people into at least doing some of it uh, without blowing up their network. I mean, that's what they're concerned about, and I, I don't blame them. I mean, I, I want a nice, stable network that doesn't go down, and I certainly don't want Professor X um, running his real video and hogging up all the bandwidth. So, I mean, it's really um, a sensitive position in that you have to negotiate these two things. Um, you also have to negotiate with the university. In, in our case, we, the university has a central computing service and they're always doing different things. For example, we found out recently that they're doing this huge student portal project. No one in the law school had mentioned it to any of us. <laughs> and so, you know, I've had to go out and um, Brian Quigley and I, who's our, uh, who's our lab manager and among other things, We've had to attend meetings about this, trying to find out more about the student portal project. And it could be a really great thing for the law school as a whole because we could use it for a variety of things. But once again, this is not something that uh, we don't have an IT manager per se, and so we're all kind of on our own. And of course you want somebody who's proactive and self-motivated. You want somebody who will go out there and do things. So. This is a, a new title that was suggested by John Mayer, actually. Why not have a technology evangelist? And this is a real title. This is something that exists at Microsoft. <laughs> um, and also at Tivoli and, and several other uh, companies. And what this person does is it's kind of a marketing position, but it's somebody who goes out there and talks about, talks up technology, and yet has a techn technical background and can do it in a coherent manner. So the question is, how did I end up doing this? Uh, I, I do have kind of a technical background. I was a database programmer. We built uh, databases for complex litigation, asbestos litigation management, in fact. And I went to law school, library school, and I've been a librarian for about six years now. So what do I do now? Um, I started out as just a regular reference librarian who really liked technology. And over time, I've kind of added to my job responsibilities. So what's interesting is these are not unique. I've met lots and lots of electronic resources librarians here who do the exact same thing I do. So it's not unique. I thought I should mention something about the center since it's on the program. Uh, at the University of Texas, we're kind of unique in that we actually contract out all of our IT work to a centralized university group called ASSETS. It's an academic computing and instruction technology, something like that. Um, so we don't have somebody in-house like you know, a Ken Hirsch who um, takes care of everything. Um, and we had no multimedia capabilities whatsoever. We have uh, one black and white scanner. <laughs> which went down recently and these poor assistants were running around to other, law, other professional schools looking for scanners. But we recently did, did buy, I think, eight scanners, which they put on secretarial staff's uh, desks and then proceeded to train no one. Um, so in response to this, I propose that we set up a Center for Technology Teaching and Learning. And um, if you're not from Texas, it, You'll notice it's cattle or the longhorns, right? Uh, all right, so <laughs> we, um, well, it's going to be, <laughs> well, actually, it's going to be located in the Georgia O'Keeffe Room, which is uh, on the fifth floor of the library. And if you've never been to the University of Texas, the Georgia O'Keeffe Room actually has a lot of these skull heads. You know, Georgia O'Keeffe is really into that, so it's, it's very appropriate. But. We're spending about $50,000. The funding is coming from a, um, a student fee. And uh, we're going to set up, I think, four PCs. It's all up in the air right now, but we're probably looking at four PCs with lots of multimedia equipment, you know, VCRs, digital cameras, um, a high-end high scanner that someone will actually know how to use, and um, whatever else we can think of, lots of software. 
the idea is that we want to provide a place where faculty members who want to do something actually can do something. Right now, no one's doing anything because there's nowhere to go. You can go, um, there's an instructional technology center that's located in the business school that anyone who's teaching at UT can go use. That would mean actually leaving the building. <laughs> that's just too far. So uh, this is why we're doing this. And of course, it'll be staffed by myself because my office is right next to it, and the four web assistants. I have four student assistants. Um, three of them are library students, and one of them is an undergrad who just is an incredible designer. So now that you have the personnel and the fa facilities, what to do next? And these are my 10 practical tips. This is, I think, one of the most important ones. Get administration to support the technology. Uh, this was really driven home to me recently because we just got a new dean about two weeks ago and we suddenly went from a dean who really did not care for technology at all to somebody who seems to care quite a bit because all of a sudden I got called into one of the associate dean's offices and, said, and he said, why don't we have a, a website like Duke's? <laughs> why is ours so terrible? <laughs> I don't do the law school's website, so I can say those things. But um, I do the law libraries. And so one of the things I'm going to be doing this summer is we're going to create every faculty member has to have a website this summer. So it may just, con it may just contain their CV, but what we're hoping is at least if we can get one page up that they'll have a place to start. So whether they like it or not, they're going to have a web page. It's kind of a new thing for us. Of course, faculty need incentives. Um, some, some of the previous speakers have talked about this already. And of course, you need financial support for adequate equipment and personnel. So those are kind of difficult things. How do you do this? And one is communication. You have to keep everybody who has anything to do with computers involved, which means I send emails updating uh, the business manager, the dean, the entire computer committee on just about everything that I do with faculty. And uh, we figure if, if they hate it, they can always delete it. But at least they know. And we also involve them in the planning. Um, I'm a member of the computer committee, which I find extremely helpful. And I almost treat them as a focus group. I go in there and I say, well, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Or what's the best way to get faculty to do this? And I find them extremely helpful. So I recommend doing that. Don't get caught in a vicious cycle. I've heard this so many times. Nobody's interested in technology. Why do we have to spend money on it? It's like, well, no one's doing it because there's nowhere to do it. And if you build it, they will come. If you don't, it'll never happen. Peer pressure is effective. We, were, we just heard about uh, children. <laughs> But other faculty members, this is very useful, um, especially the non-techie ones. If you can convert somebody who's a non-techie, uh, it, it helps tremendously. And students, I personally haven't found student, peer, student pressure to be very helpful. Um, it, I think it really depends on the school that you're at and the kind of culture that you're in. But I've found student pressure to be not effective at all. So you can take advantage of this. Um, I do a newsletter, which isn't like most typical newsletters. It's completely focused on technology. And what I do is I scan uh, newspapers. I look at articles that have to do with um, other people using technology in law-related items. So for example, my last newsletter talked about um, some judges down in, I think, Argentina who were using this program to uh, actually decide cases on the spot. They would actually go like an ambulance to a car accident. They would put in the facts and, uh, and then it would spit out a judgment, which they could overrule if they wanted to, but at least it helped them uh, to think about the issues. And so what I've been doing is I want to raise the awareness that you know, other people are using technology. It's not some newfangled thing. What I also found is that faculty members don't talk to each other about what they're doing with, fa with uh, technology. So I usually try to identify one faculty member who's doing something really interesting with um, technology, and then I write a, an article about it. So they like to hear about themselves, too. Um, 
Um, we also do something, one of my professors at UCLA called the Dog and Pony Show. So we, we had uh, faculty members who would come in and who were doing interesting things and we would have them give a presentation. Um, we also did, I did one recently uh, at UCLA, just before I left, we did one on um, PowerPoint, how to use PowerPoint. It was one of the faculty lunches, so we got lots of people to come for their free food. And uh, we, I, ha I partnered with the intellectual property professor, and we did this whole presentation, you know, kind of a, an example of what you could do with PowerPoint to teach copyright. And it was interesting so that we could have, you know, clips. We had little audio clips of, you know, look, this one is close to this version, and we had... Um, pictures. I mean, it was really quite effective. And after that, that particular presentation, one of the um, older, uh, more senior members of the faculty came up to my desk and he said, well, that was really interesting, June, but I've been teaching for 20 years and there's no way I'm ever going to need something like this. I have interacti interactivity in my class and I'll just never, ever use this. I said, that's great. You know, I think that's great. Teaching is important to you and I'm glad to hear it. Two weeks later, he came up to me and he said, you know, I was about to do this little exercise in gerrymandering, and I was thinking, we could do this in PowerPoint. I was like, yeah, you're right, we could. And so we did. It was great. He loved it. The students loved it. It was in color. It was something that he normally does. He hands them sheets of paper in black and white, and um, I think it was much more effective in color on the screen. Perseverance counts. You need to be in their faces all the time. <laughs> um, you have to attend faculty functions. You have to drop by. I drop by people all the time. They probably hate to see me sometimes, but that's the chance you take. Um, but I'll just chat. You know, I don't talk to them about technology, and usually they'll look at me and go, oh, yeah, you know, I was thinking about doing this. And I think that's very effective. If you just, you know, just your mere appearance will remind them of, of technology issues. Always follow up when someone shows interest. And this is an important one. You know, a lot of times someone will say, oh, yeah, you know, I was sort of interested in doing this. And then if you don't follow up on it, they'll never do it because it's extra work for them. It really is. You know, they can just teach their classes and they're fine. They don't need to use technology. So, you know, if you can make it that much easier for them, I think people really appreciate it. Target specific faculty. Now, this is something we do um, all the time is that I'll talk about this a little bit later, but you know, try to find specific faculty who can um, really use the technology for a good project. And start with small steps. I will do almost anything to get a faculty member interested in technology. If that means I have to do their CV, I will do it. <laughs> if it means I have to do their entire PowerPoint presentation for a conference, I will do it. Because the next time, they'll find it really annoying that they have to go through me. The next time, they want me to show them how I did it. Um, for people who don't really use a mouse, I recommend games. You know, um, the IT people really hate me because I'm always showing people the games. But you know, if I can get them to get using the mouse, that's the first step. Customization is very important. One size does not fit all. One faculty member may just want to talk to me about, um, you know, how to use Smile in his real video. Um, another faculty may want me to do the entire thing for him. And that's fine. You are never going to be able to get all the faculty members to do the same thing because they're at different levels. They have different needs. They have different styles of teaching. Um, there's just no way to do it. WebCT is great. I use WebCT. I think we're about to get Blackboard next year with the portal project. But I'm not going to force all my faculty members to go the WebCT route because not everybody needs that much stuff. I mean, some of them just want to put up a syllabus. And that's fine. So that's what we do. Training. Uh, I find it really useful to set deadlines. So even though anyone who's um, a faculty member can come up to me anytime and say, oh, I want Westlaw or Lexus training, can you, can you do it for me? And I'll just sit down with them in their office and we'll just do it. But even though that's always available, somehow it just never occurs to them to do it. So somehow if I set an actual program, if I call it a summer seminar, somehow that makes it different. And um, what I do in my newsletter is, you know, once I get to a point where I know the faculty members are going to have some time, I'll set up a program and say, all right, this, 
this is what I'm willing to teach you this summer. And here, here's the list of things that I'll show you. Or else um, we set specific dates for Westlaw and Lexus training. I mean, the reality is they can get this training anytime. But somehow by saying, all right, you can get Westlaw training during this week. Or you can get Lexus training during this week. Somehow they're more interested in it. Practice what you preach. Um, I think it's important that whoever's doing it is also a good teacher. I think it raises your credibility level and it improves the quality of the support that you can give. What I found helpful is um, I attend a lot of classes about adult education, distance ed. I create web-based tutorials. In fact, we just did one um, for Wes on Lexus. It was very interesting listening to the Chicago Kent people yesterday. Um, teaching internet resources for lawyers. This is a one credit class for uh, law students, which I did almost entirely through distance ed this time. We teach a variety of CLE courses, HTML courses. Um, I participated in a distance ed program uh, that UT Library School does with the uh, technology school in Monterey, Mexico. And then I read everything I can get my hands on. I'm sitting in the bathroom and I will read information today or something. And you need to identify technology opportunities. Um, you should know what's going on in your law school. You should know what projects the faculty members are doing. Um, you should look at the web statistics. An interesting thing that happened to me recently was uh, I was looking at the search statistics on our faculty news section and I noticed that we were getting a lot of hits on this one particular professor's name and this name of this article that he had written recently. Well, I followed up on it and we found out that it had been mentioned in the Washington Post. And there were a lot of people hitting our website looking for this article and there was no information about it whatsoever anywhere in the law school. So um, even though in the article it said, go to. <laughs> so we, um, I approached the professor, I said, you know, you don't have a web page. Um, this would be a really great thing to put on there, at least an abstract, and tell people where they can get a copy. Um, now, in this particular case, he wasn't interested because he um, he was uh, he was a little wary about the implications of it. That he he didn't want to be self-promoting. He didn't want to seem as if he were selling this article. So what we did was. Um, he, he reached out and he, he contacted you know, the journal, he contacted a lot of different people and we did get something up on the website. But you know, afterwards I said, you know, this would have been a lot easier <laughs> if you had just set up this website. And he said, well, yeah, I'll think about it. So you, know, you have to reach out, find these opportunities and do something about it. And last but not least, don't be afraid of success. They are not going to suddenly come and beat down your door. <laughs> and it is, it is controllable. For example, um, if I find that I'm really, really busy and I have way too much work, I just don't follow up like I normally do. I'll wait until I have some time and then I'll follow up on the people that I've already talked to that I knew were interested in doing something. Or let's say um, I, I won't do any marketing. I won't talk to anyone for a while. <laughs> I'll just work on my projects and then when I have time, I'll put out another newsletter and then I'll you know, talk up some other new program. And the resources can always be found. I like what um, I think it was Dean Newton said, you know, the resources can always be found. So don't be afraid. All right, so for more information, you can contact me at this uh, email address, jliebert at mail.law.utexas.edu. I'm also giving um, a presentation on distance ed, so if you want to find out more about the class that I taught using distance education, you can attend that. And I just wrote a LLRX article called Rethinking West on Lexus Training, which is going to be published, I think, July 1st. But that gives you more information about how we kind of revamped our whole legal research and writing program. Because what happened to us is that um, the, the law school decided to move the entire legal research and writing program to the second semester. So when the students first get there, that first semester, they have absolutely no research skills whatsoever. So it was kind of an interesting uh, a problem for us. And if you want to see the actual tutorial, um, you can take a look at it at this location. Once again, this is something that we kind of created in a span of about two weeks. <laughs> we did absolutely nothing fancy on it. Uh, 
So it's not the most attractive thing you've ever seen, but it was very easy to do, and um, we did very little, um, any, very little technology. We used very little technology that was difficult to use. So um, that's all I have. And Deb. Uh. Oops, oh. Um. Oh, just say no. Yeah, I have to get there. Oh, wait. There we go. Thank you. All right. Hello, I'm Deb Quantel. I'm with Cali. Um, I call this Colonel Mustard in the Library with a Candlestick because I think a lot of you know me, and when you see me, um, you run away, run away, because you know I'm going to talk to you about the wonderful world of Cali. Um, and when I say the wonderful world of Cali, I see fireworks going off, and I, I hope you two will join with me in that image. All right. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, three parts, as John has outlined here, a strategy for creating a comprehensive and malleable set of web-based teaching materials. Um, what we have done is approach in the past 18 months our lesson creation process from a slightly different way. It used to be that we would take lessons on almost any topic that came in and some of them were giant, giant treatises that could take students a semester or a lifetime to work through. Um, and in, instead what we've gone to, a modularity idea. Peter Martin spoke of it uh, yesterday, if you were here for his, his uh, online presentation. Um, it's, it's a theme of, of building small. Everything can be reordered by you as faculty if you're looking for content for your new website. Uh, or, or you can build things as a student and do things in the, in the process that you tackle them. Sometimes students in the beginning, they don't even know where their problems are. They don't even know the words and they can't find uh, their topic in the middle of everything. So the idea of creating this this uh, set of topic grids and dividing the world, say, of criminal law into about 150 buzzwords, things that you might have to know if you were going to watch Law and Order or practice, actually. Um, and, and these are helpful little words that off of each word or concept, our, our faculty members are now writing a tutorial. Um, this year, um, we had four faculty members who worked for the past 12 months, and they're wrapping up this week actually, writing criminal law lessonettes. Uh, we have about 150 topics, or little points as we call them, uh, which would be a concept, in the area of criminal law. And uh, we have a lessonette written in about 25 of them. And that might seem like, oh, well, 25 out of 150. Gee, Deb, what a pathetic year you must have had. Um, I feel bad for you. I won't run quite so fast next time I see you. I'll give you the illusion you may possibly be able to catch me. Um, sort of like buses. Where, oh, maybe I'll catch the door. Um, but actually, we're quite excited about the accomplishment of the fellows. Um, and, and we think that they did an amazing amount of work. Because the 25 lessonettes comes out to about somewhere between 12 and 15 hours, maybe, of students sitting and working through material. So we feel that we've added somewhere between 12 and 15 hours of content to material available to criminal law professors around the country that they can assign to their students as outside reading material. They can include it in their class material. They don't have to cover it in class now because it's covered deeply in a Cali lesson. Or students are going to find these on their own. Uh, we have a significant increase on hits on our website uh, starting around Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> And we don't know if it's that overeating, or if it's football, or perhaps some other event that occurs in students' lives, uh, but our server is very active on that weekend and the weeks following. Uh, so basically what the fellows did was divide up the material in criminal law uh, into these areas and then tackle it bit by bit. And it was a very interesting collegial process uh, because many faculty members tend to be uh, loners. And I think that's one of the benefits maybe of, of being a faculty member. Uh, you get to work on your projects. Uh, you, you get to work on things that excite you. And you, you work a lot alone. You don't, though, get to work with a lot of people collegially. And with our fellows, 
We had people from four different law schools coming together uh, for a full day meeting in June last year at the Cali Conference in Eugene. Uh, and then we met two, uh, t three other times. Yes, it was so much fun. It was three other times uh, for a day at various law schools, basically every quarter. And it was fascinating for me uh, to sit and listen to people discuss how they talked how they taught a single aspect of a course, examples they used, and all of that information and that sharing is incorporated in the lessons. So the lessons do not reflect a single person's viewpoint on the topic, but a person's viewpoint as filtered through a team process, as filtered in through me as the playing the role of the common student, um, the somewhat annoying, somewhat overeducated, somewhat un undereducated annoying student, filtered through our Cali editorial board, which looked at all the materials, filtered back through the fellows, and finally packaged on the CD for your viewing convenience. Um, so let me tell you about some of the success and failures that we had this past year, and, and then I'll uh, move on to sort of showing what Cali author and the materials are accomplishing. Um, what we found is that faculty members, when they work very intensely for a year on something, the learning curve is significantly higher than people who tackle any programming language for a short period of time, do something, say, whew, that was exhausting, now I'm going to go away. Um, it would be very analogous to the exercise program I've been on two years. It has a high peak activity in January and then it dives significantly for the rest of the year. And then a high peak activity the following January, and it dives down. This would be more the exercise program I'm supposed to be following, where I peak in January and I have a, maintain a maintenance level for the rest of the year. What we saw with the fellows was they absorbed Cali Author, and as they moved into writing a second tutorial, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, the complexity of the question, the thought process that they were able to undertake in handling the material, the difference between standing in front of a lecture your first week of teaching a course and standing in front of the class your 14th week of teaching the course or the second time you've teach the, taught the course. Um, we saw that learning curve and we were able to incorporate that into the materials. So I believe that these are the richest um, and some of the most complicated and deeply engaging lessons uh, that Cali has ever uh, put forth. All right, with that uh, excitement out of the way, let us move on. Um, this is what I view as Mission Impossible 3. I'm stealing Dan Hunter's movie topic idea. Um, these are all the things that faculty members are asked to do. Um, it's a tremendous amount of activity you're asked to do on the left. Um, you as, as the tech people are asked to support it. And then on the right all the ways you can do it. I put this pre-time to keep pushing me forward to get us to lunch. So how can Kelly help? This is the big question. I too am deep in suspense. <laughs> well, look, we could provide tutorials. Oh, and? Yes, how do they come, you might ask? Well, they're available on CD, web-based, our site or yours. You can now go to the Cali website and under faculty select uh, author tools and resources and you'll see that there's something called a URL builder. You can go in and create, take any lesson from our website and punch a couple buttons and you'll be given a URL which you can have your tech people or you can attach into your web page so you can have students launching Cali lessons directly from your website. None of the inconvenience of having to go to Cali's website and all of that. <laughs> um, something very exciting we've done this year for the criminal law lessons is we're writing a faculty manual. This is very standard for textbooks. For some reason, we've never done it before at Cali. This year, those of you who teach criminal law will get about a 30-page textbook sort of thing that comes with you. It will also be available on the web. This will be highly password protected. Trust me. Um, well, that sounds so political. I'm sorry. Trust me. Um, but it really will be password protected. Um, it's going to tell you the beside, behind the scenes or beside the scenes of what went into the creation of the particular lesson, the exciting things, um, MPC code sections cited, law cases cited, things that you might want to incorporate and use in your class material. Um, the lessons are modular, as I said. That means you can mix and match them as you want. For example, you could take your class syllabus on the web, attach Cali lessons in the order you want through the URL builder and have the material covered in the order and sequence you think it best suits students. And if there's something in the material you don't like, 
we can easily go in or you can easily go in and remove that particular hypothetical, that material, something else that you want to cover later in the semester you don't want to expose students to. For their safety, of course. Safety is number one. We have the fellowship program. This year we will be tackling the area of property. On Saturday, I will uh, be secluded with five faculty members from across the country. Um, we will be dividing up the property topic uh, into little parts and beginning our task. Um, my goal is to have 50 lessonettes at this time next year uh, in property law. Um, you're the first ones to hear this. The fellows will be hearing this on Saturday. <laughs> But I, I really think it's excellent uh, material to cover and it'll be a, a good addition to our, our CD and library. Oh, and here it is. Uh, criminal law we covered this year, uh, the property next year. All right, how do you get your own copy of Cali Author? Um, this website. And what can you expect to find in Cali Author? <laughs> I'll give you, good heavens, it's being possessed. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Last night when I was pacing this after three Pepsis, <laughs> and it was midnight, and my dog and I were sitting on the living room floor, and she kept wiggling around, and I thought she was bored with it, so I kept putting in less and less time. So <laughs> let's just go back, shall we, and, and, and see some of these in a little bit more detail. How do I maneuver your mouse? Oh, it's one of these. I'm a glide pad person. Perhaps I, I'm Deb, I'm a glide pad person. So I really can't use this. All right. Uh, all right, well, let me tell you what's here. It's just as exciting. Um, how can Cali help you? We can provide tutorials. What do you find in a Cali lesson? You find video, you find audio, you find images, you find text, you find branching abilities, nonlinear. Has anyone ever read those interactive stories where the young princess goes off to res rescue the knight stuck in the, in the castle and she has a decision. Does she go into the moat or does she go around the forest? You can control your students' path. You can create paths for them. They choose their destiny along path lines you've created. You as faculty members know the common path. You know who to call on for that perfect wrong answer in your class. Um, and you don't have that opportunity in an online environment, but you can help students benefit by creating those wrong paths. There are a couple ways you can use art. I think we've caught up now. All right, hold on. But, oh, wait, 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 one moment. Talk among yourselves while I move this great distance. <laughs> and to all of us watching on the web, welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, there we go. Visual cue for students. Here, uh, Professor Cavallaro included just a little graphic, a visual mnemonic, if you will, to help her students uh, in this lesson. She then goes on to include a quote from a, a legal opinion that cited that. Here, Professor Garland has created a wonderful pen and ink drawing of, of, of a frustrated wife going after her husband. And how about the alternative menu? Um, let, let me just... <laughs> I, I'm only up to one Pepsi today. I'm way behind. All right. Um, an alternative menu, you can create option choices for students off of hotspots, off of graphics. Suppose you want the student to have a completely self-directed lesson based on areas of the course they want to cover. Material that the sequence doesn't matter as much as the fact that they learn it all. Perhaps you can build off of um, an image showing the various parts of the activity. Oh, now I have to do, oh, I, there I am. I'm getting smarter. Okay. An alternative menu. Hmm, something to think about. All right, you can have video uh, in the material. Sometimes video is the best way to give material. There are a number of uh, multiple choice question types. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Options you can give to students, uh, different ways that they can uh, be asked questions. Um, some of them allow for feedback only. Some of them allow you to branch to another question. Suppose that there's a typical wrong answer students always get. You might want to take them out and explore that typical wrong answer, then bring them back. You can have them do remedial branches. You can have them do extra credit type points. Um, you can have them build answers here. Perhaps you start with the first level of analysis on this screen. You can have them match terms to categories. Um, why do certain concepts uh, relate to certain things? What are the important 
things. Students are asked to compare and contrast. You can reach a certain level of critical thinking and analytical reasoning in these lessons. Force them to move things into categories. Think about which are similar, which are different. I always think of those highlight magazines. Too much time in dentist waiting offices. Um, classify things. What are the distinctions? Why are things different? Why are they the same? You're requiring students to engage very deeply in the material and focus on the intricate parts of things. Um, sometimes more than one answer is correct. Um, why do we have policy reasons in this country? Why do we have particular laws? What are the multitude of reasons, legal, cultural, ethical, that fly, slide in? What about the ambiguous questions? What do you think a court would, how, how do you think the court would view this person's credibility? It's a fuzzy question, but give the student a chance to think it through. What about things that are a specific code section number? What are governed by um, moral rights in this country? You must know it's section 17 USC 106A. I would be your lifeline if you're ever asked that. Okay. Um, text select. Well, this is where you can really focus students in on important language in a whole paragraph. And then finally, an essay question. Let them write a summary. Let them write a small mouth answer. We often don't give them enough chance to actually write before that frightening day in December, which coincidentally postdates our usage. Hmm, thought to ponder. Um, and have them pull together ideas, link the model answer back into the section of the lesson, and you can have students repeating these lessons over and over until they're comf comfortable and confident of the material. These are the students who may ask you questions multiple times, and they're close to understanding it. And there's just one piece missing. And if they can work through something like this, they might be able to grasp it better on their own. Um. All right. This looks goofy. Oh, because I've done something goofy. One moment, please. OK, there we go. All right. Um, text pages, a great place for the faculty to just insert material, the hypothetical, images, pop-ups. They keep the student on the same page. It works like a hypertext link. You can give the student answer, you can give the student definition, you can give them more material, all sorts of things like that. A blank screen, <laughs> a challenge to authoring. Like many writers, I just read a New Yorker article where Stephen King talked about the trouble of going back to writing uh, after his accident. Um, basics of branching. This is the traditional model you see. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Well, what if we change this? What we at Cali have labeled questions in a row with sequential answers. Wait for this exciting graphic. Look at that. It's Nintendoing. It's just students moving through. They're not really focusing. They're just, I got to get to the end. I got to get to the end, the next level. I must free the queen. Um, but what happens when you mix it up? Classroom discussion goes off on tangents all the time. I usually teach with a post-it note of my goals for the day taped here to keep me from getting too far afield. Um, and how, we should be able to allow students to go far afield and then come back in during their um, their tutorials. And with, with building blocks and different question formats, you can do that. Um, you can take students from certain answers into different places. Let's see what happens. A right answer jumps students down. The expert mode, you don't need to walk them through all the basics. This student has it, reward them. Let them finish a little bit earlier sort of thing. What about a student who gets something wrong? They might need additional questions, something maybe that you covered in class, something that's covered that's more basic, that's an assumed bit of knowledge. The students don't know that they're being taken off on their branches. It is. What about the, oh, well, that's an interesting answer, but what about, did you consider? and you weave them 20 minutes later, you know you were right. <laughs> you can create that same excitement with a Cali author lesson. <laughs> you can mix these up and create remedial branches and, and extra knowledge branches in the same lessons. Any lesson you see, you can add to it, you can subtract to it, you can use it as is. Cali lessons are your tools. They're, they're your tools just as you would use supplemental readings, just as you would use web pages, just as you would use case books, just as you would bring in experts. So how can you use it? 
any way you can think of. My theory is if I can think it of, if you can think it of, we can get the tech support to do it. They like it when I say that. <laughs> and that's the end. Let's uh, use a couple minutes here uh, for questions before we break for lunch. Any questions? I do. June. <laughs> Since you have all this branching, I, I like that idea. But don't students get frustrated with the idea of not knowing when the end is? That is a problem. The question is, when is the end? Um, the students don't know when the end is coming. There's, I'm a page counter, I confess. You give me an assignment, I flip to count how many pages, how many illustrations, how many pictures, how big is the font. I process, I start reading. Um, we don't have anything like that in uh, Cali Author right now. The idea is that there is some sort of a clock on the, on the start of the lesson that says, we expect this will take you 20 to 30 minutes for a ballpark idea. We are talking about adding some sort of timing feature in that tells them. But the problem is, if there's a branch, it throws the timing off. It throws the percent finished off. So we're trying to go with a modularity approach such that students were hoping by law school have a 20 minute attention span. Friends is 23 minutes, although it's broken up for your viewing convenience by commercials. So maybe we need commercials. I'll talk to the, uh, the sponsors. Um, Betsy, did you have a question? Right, the question is, if the essays are not computer graded, what happens? Do students get feedback? Yes, the student types in their, their essay answer and they hit grade as an icon button and a model answer approaches. And actually there are two places that you as a faculty member can leave information for the student. And one could be a complete model answer and the second could be sort of a, a, a well, if you got that wrong or you had trouble with this part, here's what I suggest you look at. So the student is doing a self-grading. The way I look at it, it's just as though they were, had gone to your own school exam bank and, and looked at the materials. Yes? I think the, big, the biggest difference is that we simply can't afford to give every faculty member his or her own camera, his or her own video. I mean, it would be great if we could do such a thing, but it's just not feasible in the very near future. So, you know, maybe if we all have Macs. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a matter of economics that we had to do it this way. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of it. Oh yes, I'll just help them at their desk. Yeah, or you know, I, I take phone calls all the time. Um, I'll bring them in, I'll sit down with them. I train their RAs or their assistant, whoever is going to be doing it for them. Tom, you had a question? You know, I wish there were one solution to that, and there isn't. Um, once again, you have a lot of different personalities, and what I really try to advocate is uh, the smorgasbord idea. So, you know, you should go out and buy CD-ROMs. You should go out and buy books. You should bring in a trainer for a day or two. You should um, do whatever you can. Uh, granted, this is an expensive approach, but you know, if you want to hit these people, you know, just buying a couple of CDs or buying a couple of interactive lessons is not going to do it because not everyone learns that way. If I can add something up here, I think uh, Andrea Johnson at Cal Western, she was putting together some sort of uh, video presentation thing addressed to her colleagues about why to include materials and sort of some of the basic, not, not you know, press this button sort of teaching, but sort of the big picture um, as to why they'd want to do it. You might want to contact her. She's not at the conference this year.
Yes. We have a technology group, uh, technology users group, Tug, which is more like Tug War. <laughs> we get a lot of people together when we discuss the website. It's the marketing people versus content people and faculty members who want home pages and who don't want home pages. And how do you deal with that and have things go smoothly rather than it just turn into different constituencies within the school advocating their own positions? I never ask those questions. <laughs> I always have very specific targeted questions that they know something about. So for example, I would never go in there and say, do you like a blue background or a black? Um, I always go in there with, you know, I'm trying to target this series of sessions. When is the best time to do it? When are most faculty paying attention? Or, you know, I'm trying to do this. What's the best way to market this tool? Are you going to pay attention to a newsletter that I print in paper? Are you going to pay attention to an email? Would you be annoyed by an email? So those are the kinds of questions that I use for the with the uh, computer committee. It's never anything that will get, get me in trouble now. <laughs> yes, in the front. Is, uh, what's the schedule for converting the old DOS Cali lessons over to Cali Online? Um, the question is, what's the schedule for converting Cali, old DOS Cali lessons into the, the present? Right, in, right. Um, we're working on that now. Things are always ongoing. And what we're we each have one assigned to us, and we're converting them always. Um, we're converting a lot of them directly to the web. Um, so I don't know what the timetable is for completion, um, but, but we, if you have a favorite lesson you'd like to see converted first, um, we take requests. <laughs> <laughs> so just shoot one of us an email. Yes, is that a question? Any other questions? All right. I believe it's lunchtime. Thank you. Forget. I, always, I see those and I go, oh, those are really nice. I always forget that I have problems using them. How is this set up because I'm going to be next? Oh, it's just, uh, it's just this little cable right here. It goes into your video port. And then there's a... Uh, that's it. Hi. Let's go to Alice's house. And I think Steve will probably come in and okay, uh, help you. Tip you me, so... Yes. Yes. Okay, he's on my CD. Okay. Um, we're going to try... Yes. Okay, he's on my CD. Okay. Um, we're going to try... Yes, okay, so much. 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 Yes, okay, so much.